Welcome to Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. In the next half hour, you'll obtain insights and tools to transform your life using the biblical principles found in the 12-step program. We believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience because we all have struggles in life. Struggles with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, and relationships to name a few. You'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through life recovery. Your host is Steve Arterburn, founder of New Life Ministries and Women of Faith, author of over 100 books, and teaching pastor at Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana, one of the 20 largest churches in America. Steve is the co-editor of the Life Recovery Bible, the number one selling recovery Bible. With over 3 million copies sold, this is the Bible given to inmates by Prison Fellowship and the Pew Bible for the Salvation Army. Now here's Steve. Hello, I'm Becky Brown. I'm sitting in for Steve Arterburn today, and I'm so excited to have you here for Life Recovery Today. Welcome. We have a great guest today who's a dear friend of mine, but also has a great story that's going to encourage you and challenge you in your own recovery. First, we're going to talk about the law of service. When we talk about the laws of life recovery, it sounds pretty strict, but really it's just a, a consequence or a result of doing the things that we call laws in recovery. So the law of service says the requirement of service will result in reward. And our acts of service aren't to be done in order to gain a reward. You know, a lot of times we think it's a exchange of if I behave, then I should get a reward. That's not it at all. They're done out of obedience to what we're learning as we're equipped to do the work of the ministry. It's a result of, of you know, walking the path of recovery and seeing the results in a good way. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ, which is what Paul writes in, the, in Ephesians 4.12. We're God's hands and feet. And when we follow the law of service, we are providing for people in the way that God intended us. And in our own recovery, it's really important for us to serve others. You know, we even can go as far as the 12th step where we talk about carrying this good news to others as a result of what's happened to us. As we're faithful in our service, the reward we receive is peace and satisfaction. And that comes as a result of our obedience. No longer are we chained to that frantic feeling of being caught or doing, you know, the wrong thing and feeling shame. And as we practice service, we're walking in the path of recovery. And, you know, God wants us all to be on mission. And so when we are providing service for others, maybe it's serving in your local recovery group. Maybe it's leading a recovery group. Maybe it's being a sponsor. We're going to find the peace and that satisfaction that comes as a result of being obedient. It's very likely that God wants you to be used in one of those areas that you have struggled in and have found freedom. And so I want to encourage each of you to follow that law of service. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk to Lisa Carey, who's a dear friend of mine, but also an inspiration to so many people that she serves and she leads as well. And so I want to invite you back and we're going to have a great conversation. Are you going through your struggles alone? Do you want someone to talk to to help you through your pain? Do you feel like a failure when you relapse again, telling yourself, next time will be different? Don't walk this path alone anymore. Join a life recovery group today and be a person that your friends and family can be proud of. God created us to be in community and we believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience. There are life recovery groups all over the country and if there isn't one in your area, we can help you start one. Life recovery brings recovery to you right where you are. You'll take a journey with others to find healing and freedom. Whether you're looking to join a group or start one, New Life Ministries is here for you. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or visit liferecoverytoday.net. Welcome back to Life Recovery Today. I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. It's Lisa Carey. 
She is a dear friend of mine and she's passionate about helping people find recovery. She is the director of member services at CareSource, which is a mission-driven healthcare organization. She also serves on the leadership team at Be Hope Church in Beaver Creek, Ohio, where she also helped launch a recovery ministry that thrive, is thriving still today. She's active in the recovery community in Dayton, and she lives with Ryan and their children, Lucy and Max in Beaver Creek. And I am so delighted that you are here today, Lisa. And uh, I'm so blessed to call you my friend, and I can't wait for the rest of the audience to get to know you as well. How are you doing today? Oh, that's so kind of you, Becky. I tell you what, I'm so excited to be here. This is a great opportunity. I'd love to just share the things that Jesus has done in my life. I'm so excited for them to hear. You know, I know you've been in recovery a long time. How many years exactly? 13. I will celebrate 14 years at the end of November, but we don't count early. Okay. <laughs> we don't count early, do we? You know, Lisa, I've heard your story and I can't wait for the audience to hear about life before recovery. So just, you know, you can take a few minutes just to kind of talk about life before the bottom. Sure. So I, I grew up as a military kid. We moved around and then we settled in Dayton, Ohio. I didn't have anything unhappy in my childhood. No significant events led to my alcoholism. Um, I was healthy. All my needs were met. My father, though, was an alcoholic. And so he got sober in 1997 and he was active in recovery until he died in 2010. So I grew up around abnormal drinking without understanding that it was abnormal drinking. I remember once a cop pulled us over and my dad gave me his whiskey bottle to hide behind me while the cop wrote out the ticket. And I didn't understand that that was anything different. Um, despite his alcoholism, my father was so successful. He was a test pilot and a brilliant engineer and people loved to be around him, but at home he was a perfectionist and a critic. And I chased that approval. All of my step four inventory work points back to that. My perception that I didn't get enough of my father's love when I was young. We got close right before he passed away, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I grew up in the Methodist church. Attendance was more social than spiritual. I did not develop an individual relationship with Jesus. I didn't believe he cared about me individually. And I didn't believe that I had earned his attention or his love. I had a terrible time getting along with others. I was consumed with anxiety. I felt less than everyone else, and I expected too much from friends. When my feelings got hurt, I shut people out and I ended relationships. And I had this constant need for external validation. Nothing could fill me up. I tried to find happiness in achievements and food and friendships, and then later in my life in romantic relationships, but I could never fill that soul hole. I went to college, I joined a sorority, and that's the worst place for people like me. I was <laughs> comparing myself to everyone else. My anxiety tripled and then I found alcohol. Mm. And, you so, know, oh, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. Alcohol solved so many of my problems. It filled that soul hole. And when I was drinking, I was fun to be around. People enjoyed me. I was confident. I drank through college in my early 20s. I found friends who also enjoyed drinking. And I spent several years in bars and forming unhealthy relationships. Hmm. So how did you know yeah. when you were at the bottom and you needed help? You know, I had a warning call about four years before I got sober. I realized I'd crossed a line and that I was serving a physical need in addition to an emotional one. And I reached out to my dad, who was in recovery by this point, and said, I need help. I need you to come help me. And he delivered me to the rooms of recovery. And I spent four years trying to understand how a spiritual program would fix a physical problem that I had and I didn't work the steps and things got worse and worse. And I went to the ER about 12 times in a three year period. And on my last visit, the charge nurse was someone that I knew from the rooms of recovery and mm. she checked me into the hospital and saved my life. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. So after that, it wasn't like you were miraculously delivered, right? No. No, you know, although I did, there was a chaplain at the hospital who came to see me and he listened to my story and I had nothing left to lose. So I shared with him everything that was going on. And he said, I hear a lot of shame. Do you know Jesus? 
And I said, well, I know who Jesus is, but I don't have, I don't think Jesus is interested in me. I think Jesus is probably disgusted with me. And he said, you know, what if, just what if Jesus forgave you? What if Jesus died on the cross for you as well? And my heart shifted a little bit and I became willing. I became open and willing to the idea that things could get better. And so that is, oh, that's beautiful. Thank God for that chaplain to see that, that chaplain. Yeah, that wounded place and that, that, that hurt that was just so, it was separating you from the answer to your problems, right? It was, it was. And, you know, I think that that's such an important um, part of my story, just that he approached me without judgment mm -hmm. and was very patient and very calm and very kind to me. And so I was open to hearing what he had to say. So then you go home. <laughs> you go home and the work <laughs> begins. Exactly. And what did that work look like for you in those oh, beginning days? It was, I stayed right next to my sponsor. I didn't, I knew I had a building, I was building a relationship with Jesus, but I had no idea what that meant or what I needed to do next. And I couldn't mm -hmm. make decisions on my own because all of my decision making was compromised. Mm -hmm. And so I leaned on her for every decision, patient woman that she was. And I worked the steps and, you know, we we got real busy. We, I did one, two, and three right there in that, in that hospital room. And we got right to work on inventory. And when I was done with inventory, we prayed for my character defects and, and prayed for God to take them away. And then we got to work on amends. And I was, I was hard at work for a long time. We finished the steps. We went back and started the steps again. And when we finished them a second time, we went back and started them a third time. Mm, we just beautiful. worked. Yeah. Mm. I think so many times we want that instantaneous recovery. We, you know, okay, I surrender, it's over, and I'm done with, you know, all of that. But what you have just described is that commitment to finding freedom, to, to really working through, and all these years later, you're still doing it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm constantly in the steps. Um, I'm a complicated piece of machinery, I need an owner's manual and step work helps me understand why I react to things the way I react to. And I'm just so grateful for that. I'm so grateful to have a non-judgmental place where I can um, unpack and understand why I behave the way I behave and a safe place to change my behaviors. And that's what recovery is. It certainly is. And it's a new way of life. I think um, one of the challenges when we talk to folks who are early on in just recognizing that they have a problem and it's not just going to go away is helping them understand it's one step at a time. And did you have that experience as well? I mean, it sounds like your sponsor was really instrumental in walking you through those steps, but yeah. did you, did you have a trouble, did you have trouble with doing one step at a time or were you just like, I want this to be over? You know, it was some days, some days it was one, one hour at a time, right? Some days go. it was hard just to process an hour. Um, other days it made a whole lot of sense to plow through step work and, and make things move forward. I like to make things move forward. I like to get things done. I wanted a checklist and I had to yes, understand. You do. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, well, do. we're going to take a break real quick, Lisa, and then we're going to come back. There's one part of your story that I know and I want the others to hear it. So we'll be right back. It's hard to find a trusted friend when you're in crisis. Someone who's been there and understands but who also has the training and skill to give you practical help. Family, friends, and churches want to help, but often they're not equipped to care for those dealing with problems like addiction and pornography, infidelity, anger, depression. New Life Ministries is here to provide help and hope in life's hardest places. We're not focused on making people feel better, we're focused on helping people do the work that will help them be better. At New Life, we have resources available to help you, like books, DVDs, CDs, workshops, and our network of licensed counselors. If you need help, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE and begin your new life today.
Welcome back. I don't know about you, but I'm so encouraged to hear Lisa's story. And um, just, you know, it, it is the power of a decision that has changed everything for her. Now, Lisa, one of the things that you do that I know that I think makes such a difference in your life is your prayer ritual. And so, um, as you said, you've been in recovery, you know, 13 years, and um, I want you to tell the audience, how, what is this prayer ritual that I'm talking about? So I was fortunate to get sober around a lot of old timers, and they told me how to behave, what I had to do. And I didn't question it and did exactly what they told me. And, and it's worked for me. So I, I get out of bed every morning. And the very first thing I do is hit my knees because I need to be reminded that I'm not God. He is right. And, and so I am humbled that way. And I thank God for keeping me sober the day before I ask him, Hey, can we do this sobriety thing one more time, one more day? And I do the third step prayer, um, which has in it the phrase, relieve me of bondage of self. So I may better do thy will. Only I say, relieve me of bondage of Lisa so that I may mm. better do thy will because I need to remember that I'm my problem, right? I'm my mm. problem. I sit in quiet for a while, trying to listen for what God has for me. And I have to do that before I leave my room because the world will hit me the minute I leave my room. And then... I pray for anyone I have a resentment against, which is a really easy way to um, encourage yourself to let go of resentments. I, I, if someone has irritated or frustrated me, I pray for their, their health, their happiness, their well-being, their joy. And then throughout the day, I have an ongoing conversation with God. And it's, it's just like a chat thread. I'm sending up things to him. And sometimes I get messages back. And some days I'm just sending up things to him. And then at the end of the day, I hit my knees again. And I say, thank you so much for keeping me sober today. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. Mm. And I try to stay in one day. I, mm. I try real hard just to stay in today. Because that's really all the sobriety any of us have is just today. That's right. It is one day at a time. I love the, the reason why, obviously, now the audience knows why I love that ritual of yours. And I think the dependence on God is so powerful, as opposed to the prayer of a lot of folks who are struggling with addiction, which is God help me, which is a really good prayer, but it can feel as though you're disconnected from God. And so once you move into that recovery stance, that surrender, it's giving, it's starting the day by giving God the day and then ending the day just being reminded that he had it all along. It's beautiful. That's right. I have real problems with pride. I have to remind myself over and over again that I'm not the one in charge. Uh, I have to do the same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's just, if, if you, it, listen, I know a lot of people don't think they need recovery, but pretty much most people need recovery from pride. So I think that might be one of those things they could go to a life recovery group sure. about. <laughs> sure. So when did you, um, when you started uh, working in the recovery ministry that you're currently in leadership with, what, what, what were some game changers? You had been in the traditional steps for many years, still, still active in that. What do you think the difference is in the church-based ministry versus just you know, the regular rooms. Oh, I love that we're all talking about the same higher power. I think that mm. that is so powerful. And that keeps us focused on higher power and not on self, which I think is mm. really important. Um, one of the things that was the biggest game changer for me was that, you know, I got to lead step studies of women who were working the steps for the first time. And watching women walk in broken, ashamed, um, afraid to interact with each other, and then six months later, watching them leave, and they were um, just restored and inspired and going out to change the world, was that was, that was really powerful. And then in those rooms, I learned, hey, just because you don't drink alcohol like I drink alcohol doesn't mean we're not exactly alike. Our coping mechanisms are different but our underlying hurts and pains are not. And so that, that helped me um, almost reassimilate back into normal culture. I, I really yeah. felt like a, um, an alcoholic outsider for a long time, but that really helped me um, see how similar I was to everyone else. And, and so yeah. I loved that. 
I love that too, because I think so many times, well, the opposite can occur. People who do not struggle with a, an addiction to an, uh, a substance or a behavior can begin to think, I'm not like them. I don't have, I'm not like those people. So it's that, you know, we're all looking on the outside, looking in, and the reality is there's room for all of us to come together in the rooms. That's right. That's right. And, and it's the connections that people form are so beautiful. I have a woman I just started sponsoring who feels very alone. She doesn't have a lot of friends because she's chased them off in her addiction. And she can't believe how many friends she's making in recovery. And, and they're better and more meaningful relationships than she's had in her life. And so it's fun. It's fun to watch God at work. I mean, he's just mm -hmm. everywhere. It's just so much fun to watch. I was thinking, you know, you, you know, someone who's alone um, as a result of their addiction, it's because of the chains of the past. It keeps them stuck there. And so in the process of recovery, and I'm thinking of, you know, when we're making amends or we're making the lists, um, we're keeping current with our relationships. And yes. it's a healing experience because no longer do we have to shift our gaze, you know, like we can't make eye contact, but we can actually connect with people on a genuine level. And there's nothing like um, being in a recovery group where, you know, you just, you know that people get you. And I yeah. know that you know that. Yes. Yes. I love it. The, what you said about amends is so true. I noticed when I finished my first amends that I could look my family in the eye again, that I could look some of my close friends in the eye again. And that was uh, a game changer for me because I'd been so ashamed for so long. And, and that um, I, my mother still to this day, oh, I love her so much, still to this day, she'll worry about, oh, is it okay if I have a beer while we're at a restaurant? That beer is not going to jump across the table into my hands. I promise you it's not right. And it's okay. But um, in the recovery rooms, people get you and understand you. And there's not that, um, that negotiation or that navigation around your perceived broken parts. Um, truly in recovery, your broken parts are the things that are most useful. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Lisa, to those who are watching who may not have um, the courage yet to surrender, which is seems like an oxymoron, but what would you say to encourage the viewers to seek recovery? Oh, don't give up. Just don't give up. Um, I've seen too many people give up and we lose them. Mm. It is easier than you think. God wants nothing more than for you to be healthy and happy and whole. And it can, it can be done. I mean, if I could get sober, I really do believe there's hope for everyone out there. And so find a church, find a room of recovery, go to any of the 12 step meetings, ask for help, be humble and teachable, and just keep trying. Because hmm. it does get so much better in recovery than it ever was in active addiction. Hmm. It's such a great um, message of hope. There is always hope, you're still breathing. And, you know, as long as you're breathing, there is a place for you to find recovery and to find hope. I just want to thank you so much, Lisa, for um, sharing your story, your journey of recovery. And I, and I know it has encouraged our audience today. We're going to take a quick break and uh, I have some closing thoughts. But thanks again, Lisa. Life recovery isn't just about making the courageous choice to give up an addiction or dependency. It's a journey towards health wholeness and becoming your very best you. If you need resources to help you in your journey, we can help. There are many life recovery resources that you can do on your own, with a group, or with your church. We have Bibles, workbooks, and devotionals that you can use to work your recovery right where you are. That's the beauty of life recovery. To learn more or to get the Life Recovery Bible or any other life recovery resource, visit liferecoverytoday.net or call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE. 1-800-N-E-W-L-I-F-E. Welcome back. I know that you enjoyed hearing Lisa's story and 
I just, I can't say enough about her spirit and her intention to help other people find freedom through recovery. You know, uh, we believe that life recovery is a pathway of freedom and it's a sanctification process. As you work through the steps and as you continue to connect with your group, it makes all the difference in your journey. And it, it really makes you the best version of you. It's who you were meant to be. And God can provide those people and the groups and we can help you find somebody as well. You know, she mentioned step three and step three is we made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. And some of us need to take that step every single day, turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Our complete dependence on God will help us discover who we really are. Um, when we recognize that he loves us and he has a plan for our life, it will make all the difference in the world. Surrendering our wills and our lives to our loving God, and that helps us to cease from being God ourselves, which is what Lisa was talking about, you know, that she prays every day to remind herself that God is God and she is not. And it's the way that we can find freedom and find a path to, to live our lives clean and sober and to be of service to other people. It's one of the healthy dependencies that will help us in our recovery and in our lives in general. Other healthy dependencies can include your recovery groups, uh, the people in the group, and your sponsor. Sponsorship is so powerful in the life of somebody who's working through recovery. And it's also important for those who have worked through recovery to begin to be of service in sponsorship to other people. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12 say, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Some of you are struggling right now either with a dependency on alcohol or drugs. It may be a habit. It may be you're looking at pornography or maybe you're eating too much or you're buying too much or maybe you're gambling. You can turn your life and your will over to God. You can surrender to a loving God who has a purpose and a plan for you. And that's why that the prophet Jeremiah reminds us you know, God has a hope and a future for you. It's not to harm you. It's to bring you into the life that he planned for you long, long ago. I hope that something today will encourage you to take that next step. Maybe call us and, and we'll connect you with a life recovery group. Or maybe you reach out to a friend and say, I think I need some help. Whatever it is, take that step today. You won't regret it. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us for Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. We hope this program has helped you integrate God's truth and wisdom into your recovery journey. This program is brought to you by New Life Ministries, and it's your support that keeps this program on the air. When you contact us for any reason, be sure to let us know that you watch on NRB. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or go to liferecoverytoday.net. Please join us again next week for more Life Recovery Today.